Hi, this is Michael Glickman of Gold Coast Arts, home to Long Island's most vibrant arts center and international film festival. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to an online, welcome you and our online audience to our new Cultural Insider series. Today's program will focus on looking at the Holocaust through film, and we have a very special guest with us. We are joined by Dr. Michael Berenbaum, a writer, lecturer, and teacher who consults on the conceptual development of both museums and the development of historical films. He is director of the Ziggy Zerling, Zering, excuse me, Institute at the American Jewish University, where he's also a professor of Jewish studies. Michael served as project director of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, authoring its seminal foundational report to the president of the United States, and he oversaw its creation. Michael then worked with Steven Spielberg as president and CEO of what is now the USC Shoah Foundation. He has authored and served as editor of 22 books, scores of scholarly articles, and hundreds of journalistic pieces. He has been a producer, executive producer, historical consultant, interviewee, and writer for many films that won Academy Awards and Emmy Awards, including One Survivor Remembers and The Last Days. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Did I miss anything in giving your introduction? No. <laughs> So um, let's get started as we... Uh... You, actually, you, actually, you actually missed one thing, which is my first award in religion and media was called the Silver Angel Award. And the problem when you get a, a, an award title like that is who can you tell? If you tell your wife, she understands you're not quite an angel. She'd like you to put the cap on the toothpaste and to lift up the seat, uh, to put down the seat. Um, when you share a bathroom. Can't tell your teenage kids you have the devil incarnate for them. So I did the only honorable thing a man could do, which is I told my mother, who said, now that you're an angel, try being a mensch. <laughs> well, for those of us who have had the privilege and pleasure of working with you over these years, I think we certainly would describe you as a mensch. So uh, you've hit your stride there. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's dive in. Can you talk about how important it is for films about the Holocaust to appeal to audiences that go beyond the Jewish community? Well, I think the most important thing is that audiences um, now understand that the Holocaust is of universal appeal. And with the possible exception of films in Yiddish or in Hebrew, um, every Holocaust film appeals to a general audience. And even Israeli film has made an extraordinary uh, contribution to American film. Israeli film has made an extraordinary contribution to American film. And consequently, there's an international audience for all Holocaust films. Um, certainly the films done in other countries, whether it's uh, films in Germany, films in Austria, films in the Czech Republic, uh, films in Poland, all appeal to a non-Jewish audience. The Holocaust has taken its place as the paradigmatic experience of evil in the 20th century and still the awesome symbol of evil in the world. And consequently, films are of universal appeal. So talk a little bit about that. Um, when we look at films that come out of countries like Germany and Poland and Hungary, uh, do you think those serve as kind of welcome and or necessary way for filmmakers to uh, make his or her country come to grips with their past? Well, let's take a wonderful example of a recent film that came out of um, Hungary, which is 19... Hungary has had actually two recent films that have been extraordinary. It had 1945. 1945 um, is a black and white film of two Jews who return to the small town and their return to the small town and the fear that they've come back to take over their property and their possessions leads the town to go into an absolute uproar and to come to terms with what it was that happened when these Jews were driven out of the town in 1944. Remember the Hungarian experience was one year as long, meaning that the deportations from um, ghettoization occurred in April, deportations in May and by May of the next year, 
uh, the populate the uh, war was over and the Jews were liberated. The second film in Hungary, which is extraordinary, deals less with Hungary, but much more with the Holocaust itself, and that's The Son of Saul, which takes us literally into the gas chambers of Auschwitz and sees the responsibility that was um, the Germans for the murders and the way in which they had forced Jews to participate as under commando in these special units in the um, adjacent elements of um, uh, bringing the people into the undressing room, taking the bodies out of the gas chamber. These two uh, films, both done um, in recent times in Hungary, during a time, ironically, where Hungary has not known a lot of cultural freedom, uh, and a lot, lot of freedom because it has a nationalistic government that's extremely uh, right wing, uh, have made a real impact on Hungary. Um, you had f for a very long time a reluctance in Germany to confront the Holocaust and then the dam was opened. And ironically, the dam was opened with a very popular American docu-drama the Holocaust in the 1970s. And an ironic uh, joke was told in uh, Germany, especially in West Germany, which is that the docudrama had more impact than the original. And uh, that was meant with sarcasm, but since then, there have been tremendous efforts in Germany to raise the issue of the Holocaust and also a series of combination of documentaries and film and, and uh, feature films that confront the Holocaust in a direct way and bring us to terms with the uh, perpetrators who were Germans. And in that sense, um, filmmaking was ahead of the curve because for a long time in Germany, there was the idea they were the bad Nazis, but the rest of the German population was, um, uh, was not responsible. And films have brought, us to, brought the Germans in particular, and therefore the world, to terms with the responsibility, not only of the perpetrators themselves, but of ordinary Germans for participation and for collaboration and also for being, relatively speaking, um, bystanders, though they have depicted some upstanders. It, it seems to me that there's a necessary challenge between showing the historical accuracy of life and death during the Holocaust, particularly in scenes that take place in concentration camps. And I suppose most filmmakers' goals when they're making these films are to do so with wide appeal. Can you speak about the sensitivities and the balance when they are depicting these, these moments? When filmmakers come to me, the first thing I tell them is don't add drama, let the drama speak forth. And that is that where films begin to falsify is when they re really believe that they have to add drama to the um, events instead of let the drama that actually is part of the events unfold. Um, let's go back to um, um, an interesting juxtaposition of film. Um, many of us are old enough to remember Sophie's Choice. Sophie's Choice was a 1980s uh, film starring Meryl Streep and Ironically, it was based on an extraordinary novel by Bill Styron, William Styron, who wrote The Confessions of Nat Turner and wrote uh, Sophie's Choice. And it was the story of a, um, the post-war story with flashbacks to the Holocaust. And the most pivotal scene in the film is when Sophie, a Polish non-Jew, arrives at Auschwitz. And because she's a, a Pole, she is not con a Polish non-Jew, she's not condemned to death. Instead, the um, person making the selection, the German SS officer making the selection, 
gives her what is called Sophie's Choice. Choose one of two of your children who will survive and the other one will be taken to die. When William Styron um, writes of that, Styron does something incredible. That's the moment in which he doesn't do, even with all the power of a novel, a novelist is all powerful, a novelist can control every aspect of reality. He doesn't enter into Sophie's mind at that point. What instead he does is he asks what manner of man, and he's gender specific at that point, asks a woman to choose between her two children. And he goes into an abstract discussion of the perpetrator. In the film, this is obviously the high point of a drama. It's the most excruciating moment um, virtually that you can imagine. What's enormously interesting about the film, and it has, what shall we say, Meryl Streep, we can all concede that she is probably the greatest actress of this generation. On any list of three, she's on any list of three. On any list of two, she's on any list of two. And one can debate whether she's on any list of one, but I would probably be very comfortable saying that. She is able to express the total tension in her face, in her body, in her movement and in her mechanism and in the way in which she's acting. And in fact, to play the role, she learned both German and Polish. And the filmmaker has, the, uh, the, the actress has that moment in which he doesn't probe her talking about it. She shows us what she's going through at that point. And that means that you have to use the power of film to do it. Now, you have problems in film in certain respects also. We can't get characters who are as emaciated as the Jews were emaciated. Some characters will lose 30 or 40 pounds, but they're not gonna lose 80 or 90 pounds. They're not gonna weigh 68 pounds or 70 pounds. Um, they have to look taunt. And um, there's also then the falsification of, um, that takes place in certain films. When they try to imagine what's there without really paying attention to what's there. And then sometimes you have a, a push that's really powerful for authenticity. Let me give you a, a small example. Um, there was something known as the Auschwitz Walk. In what was the Auschwitz Walk, because you had limited energy, if it was the winter, you tried to step in the tracks of someone who had walked before you. If it was mud season, you were afraid that you would put your feet down into the mud and couldn't get them up. So you walked, you hobbled from one place to the other. And if you look at films that try to get the most authenticity, they go after precisely those types of small details which the actors then know how to do and do very brilliantly. Uh, but then there's all the elements of, of um, adding drama, falsification, sometimes vulgarization. You also used to have um, different restrictions with regard to nudity and consequently, and with regard to how intense do you want to make it? How much of the violence do you want to show? Now we've had a coarsening of America and the loosening of those standards so people can show the dehumanization that took place in a very different way. Do you think film has played a greater role in Holocaust remembrance and education than any other art form? I think films played uh, an, an absolutely major role, certainly a, a more major role than um, uh, creative arts. Um, I would say it uh, 
certainly reaches a different audience than, for example, museums. And you and I have worked in museums and believe that museums play of an absolutely pivotal role in Holocaust education, commemoration, and memorialization. But remember, um, film both receives an audience, and that is when it's in the theaters, you choose to go. And then um, as it appears on the, multi, on the multiple ways in which we screen video these days, it also reaches people who don't go into museums and who don't go into theater. And consequently, it's seen by uh, millions and, and, and um, hundreds of millions of people and certainly has a dramatic impact. It's far more seen than books are read. It's far more um, seen than museums are visited. And it's around us all the time. What do you see as the future of Holocaust films, particularly when we move into a moment when there won't be survivors in our communities any longer? You know, everybody um, has been wondering if there would develop something called Holocaust fatigue. <laughs> Enough already. Uh, and then filmmakers um, have what we call passion projects. A story grips them and they want to tell that story. I read scripts on the Holocaust, you know, uh, twice and three times a month by people who are wrestling with telling that story. The question then becomes whether they can get funding to pull it off. And then there are documentaries that are being uh, created all the time because somebody comes across, again, an incredible story, a moving story, a meaningful story, a passionate story, uh, that they feel the great urgency to, the great urgency to uh, tell. We also have the example of Steven Spielberg, who waited a long time to create Schindler's List and waited for him to, uh, to achieve a certain type of film maturity. And consequently, um, great filmmakers emulating Spielberg will ask themselves the question, uh, am I ready? And is this the type of film I want to make? And what do I want to test myself against? How do I push my art form and my creative talents to the extreme? And consequently, they will come back to Holocaust films, um, sometimes for better and sometimes for worse. And films, uh, let, let me tell you a, a peculiar story. Um, we all remember the film Inglorious Bastards. Uh, film is uh, uh, a Tarantino film about seemingly uh, with Brad Pitt, seemingly about a um, advanced intelligence group uh, of Jews who come in and plot to kill Hitler and then actually um, um, succeed in murdering Hitler uh, and the like, something that never happened. Now, the most interesting part of that is there actually have been two very good documentaries about German Jews who became refugees in the United States who went back to fight for the Allies. One film is called The Ritchie Boys and the other film is called About Face with the idea that they've come about face and gone back into Germany. And they served as advanced intelligence unit. They served as mayors of the um, occupation. They served as leaders of interrogation. Uh, a very dramatic story, but not a story of assassinating Hitler. Inglorious Bastards told the story so well that I was in a preview with the father of one of the actors in fact, of the actor who killed Adolf Hitler in the film. Now, the father is a professor of psychology at a Harvard University. Not exactly an intellectual lightweight. 
and he found himself jumping out of his seat and cheering the assassination of Hitler. Afterwards, I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, what happened? He said, well, I guess it's been the fantasy of every Jewish boy growing up and he's a little bit older than I am growing up in the war and the post-war era. It's been the fantasy that they would kill Hitler. And my kid killed Hitler. <laughs> he said, I know on an intellectual level, it didn't happen. But seeing Tarantino tell the story made me believe, believe against belief that actually did happen and it was my kid. And he was absolutely amazed at his own response. And being a psychologist, he spent a good deal of time analyzing the response, <laughs> but it's an incredible story. And Tarantino made it, made it believable. Now, it, he made other things, they didn't scalp, they, they wouldn't have scalped these people, they didn't, they, you know, that's stick and um, it diminished in a very real way it diminished the power of the film by uh, engaging in in a couple of shtick but tarantino is tarantino so you know it, it leads me to believe and maybe this is too open ended a question but it, what do you want for an audience to walk away from feeling after they've seen a film about the holocaust look Every film has something it's trying to impart to its audience. Um, I have multiple, you, you introduced me, I wear multiple hats. The historian in me likes them to convey information. The ethicist in me wants to make sure that they don't dwell on the violence for violence sake and they don't begin to enjoy the violence there's a you know when we create museums we have a problem which is how do you show dehumanization without dehumanizing the people again and the same task is in film how do you show the violence without glorifying violence and how do you make sure that primary identification is not with the and not with the for which this was perpetrated but with the victim and you come away being appalled by the crime and you have to do that without creating a, a, a you know a, a, a moral a, a, i don't want to say a moral drama but a a, a cheap and easy sermon but for my mind, the worst Holocaust film that we could have is one in which you begin to identify with the perpetrator and begin to become convinced because you've begun to accept the perpetrator's narrative of what they were doing and what they were trying to accomplish. And that would be profoundly dangerous. So if you can identify with the victim, if you can become a Paul Remain, or become appalled by the crime. And if you can see its complexity and its multi-dimensionality, then the films achieve something significant. Let's run through a, a little bit of uh, a lightning round of questions. Um, what was the first film you worked on? I have to, I have to um, remember, well, I worked uh, in creating the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, we worked on a series of films. Um, we did a film on anti-Semitism, we did a film of um, Nazism between uh, 1918 and 1933. And the most important film we did is the final film of the, um, of the um, museum which is that we had a problem, how do you end a story of the Holocaust? 
in Israel, they could end it by showing you um, a beautiful vision of Jerusalem. If you go to Yad Vashem, Israel's memorial to the Holocaust, you come out and you overlook a beautiful in Green Park in Jerusalem. And the walls that are flowing through block your vision of industrial Jerusalem and block your vision of the slums of a section of Jerusalem. So you're left with this pristine beauty as if the answer is, um, and the answer is, uh, is in the creation of the country. Israel, what do you do in the aftermath of the Holocaust? We couldn't do that in Washington. So we decided that the only people who traversed our world with that world were the survivors themselves. And we created a film really in which survivors described their story with the idea that there were six million victims, six million Jews who were killed. Each one had a story. There were survivors and each one of them had a story. And we, pre we presented fragments of a story. It's called Testimony. And um, that was the beginning. And I learned the whole craft of filmmaking. And filmmaking is another tool of storytelling. And storytelling is something that teachers do, something that writers do, something that is as ancient as the Bible and preceded the Bible when all there were were oral traditions. And storytelling, the, the, the great part of storytelling in film is you have any, you have no limits in what you can imagine and what you can convey to the audience. And that's the very exciting, that's the very exciting thing that you have with film. And we use the skills of film to create a museum with the idea that what's the difference between a film and a museum, a film has moving imagery and a captive audience. And a museum has captive imagery and a moving audience. Because audiences move from one dimension to another. So those were the first films that I really worked on. And then I've done, a, I, I did, um, prior to that, doc, a couple of documentaries. And since then, I've uh, worked on, been interviewed by, created, and, and shaped, and um, in the best sense of the term, engaged with films and filmmaking all the way through. The one thing I have not done is to direct, and I think that's an act of mercy on the film viewing public. <laughs> well, there's still time, so we'll uh, we'll hold out hope. Can you, um, uh, as we come to a close, uh, two questions. Uh, what are the two Holocaust films that everyone must see? And then um, as, as we sort of round this out, as the world reopens, what's your hope for the future? Let me answer the second question first so I can think a little bit about the, the first question. Um, <clears throat> my hope for the future is that, number one, we appreciate the blessing of the future. Um, when my, we did a film called One Survivor Remembers the Gerda Klein, Klein story. And Gerda said something incredible when they received the Academy Award. She said, all of you who face a boring evening at home, all of you are winners. Because I come from a place where the greatest privilege was to have a boring evening at home. I hope we can appreciate what it is to embrace someone who's not a spouse and not a child, to go to work and have the normal interaction around a cooler with somebody else, to be able to go to a film and see a film, to be able to go to a museum, to be able to hike a, a trail in the park, to be able to earn an honorable living and really appreciate what an extraordinary blessing the ordinary elements of life are. I also hope that we can have resilience. I'm fearful that all of this increased hatred that we've experienced in the world has occurred at a time of relative prosperity. And I wonder how much hatred we're gonna have 
at a time of economic scarcity. So my hope to the future is that we can turn toward each other and not on each other, and we can appreciate the multiple blessings of the ordinary life that we led prior to the coronavirus and what privileges we had living in a place where we could have social action, social interaction. Two films, um, you might as well start with the toughest and the longest, which is Claude Lanzmann's nine and a half hours, nine and a half hour film show off. I assign it in class, um, two long evenings with the idea that it's the gold standard of documentaries that may be the most important uh, Holocaust documentary ever made. If you're gonna look at a perpetrator film, we did a film about um, 19 years ago called Conspiracy, starring, starring uh, Kenneth Branagh, uh, Stanley Tucci, uh, Colin Firth, which is a 94 minute reenactment of the 90, 94 minute Avanze conference at which the uh, leaders of Germany, the 15, what we would call in Vietnam terminology, the best and the brightest were informed of the final solution, were informed that the modality would be gas. It's one of the most violent films imaginable because it's all words about how killing was gonna take place. So, uh, Michael, we're coming to a close. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. I want to thank you again for joining me today, live from Los Angeles all the way here to New York, and offering a glimpse into your world, your craft, and your talent. To our online audience, I want to thank you for joining us. Please be sure to visit goldcoastarts.org for more information and to stay connected to the exciting programs that this incredible organization continues to offer. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, everyone. Thank you.